You can get ready. Okay, so we're in our final week in our series called Inspired. And I hope that you have been inspired at some point. At some point, I, feel, I hope that God used uh, his words or, or anything that he gave me um, or anything that maybe you had a conversation with someone else that somehow through this series and the reading of scripture and studying and by the power of the Holy Spirit, you were inspired in some way. It made you think about your relationship with God just a little bit different. And so this is where we, we have been for the past couple weeks in this. We're going to finish it up. This week and go into onto something else uh, starting next week as we kind of enter a thankful season. And here's what we've looked at so far. We looked at uh, Mark chapter 1, not in any particular order here. Mark chapter 1, we shared in an inspiring story about Jesus, right? Who's inspiring in and of himself, right? The name, the name Jesus itself is inspiring. But this story in Mark chapter, uh, chapter 1, if I've got this right, uh, was about Jesus... Um, building his team. Uh, he was about to embark on his ministry journey, and he needed these guys to help him out, right? He desired to have these guys to help him. He didn't need them. He desired to have these guys to help him out. So he goes and he does his thing, and he inspires people, right? Ordinary people to join him in his ministry and his journey here on his ministry on earth, right? It was an inspiring team-building Team building passage. Let me look at uh, Acts chapter 9. This is a really cool story, familiar story for many, about a guy named Saul. We know him as the Apostle Paul. And it's an inspiring story of conversion, right? How Paul was a chief persecutor, his own words, of Christians, right? The chief of sinners, he would say. And like the worst guy in the room. And somehow, somehow, God got a hold of his heart, well, by the power, the literal power, in the presence of Jesus. Right in front of him on the road to Damascus, and he is converted. He is converted to be being a believer in Jesus Christ. Went from being a persecutor to going through this inspirational moment. Eventually, would become the most inspirational moment in his life, which then in turn had an effect on the rest of us because we're still reading the stories, the inspired stories that Paul penned today by the inspiration of, of the Holy Spirit. That was Acts chapter 9. Last week we were in 2 Kings 22, and we saw how when the Word of God is remembered and followed, it creates an inspiration for revival, right? Revival, one of our favorite words around here. It, it creates an inspiration for revival in the hearts of God's people. Listen, that's contagious. And so when you have a revival of the people of God, that new once knew God and knew God's word well, but maybe have strayed a little bit, but they come back to it, there is an incredible release of the Spirit, an outpouring of the Spirit of God. And when God's word is rediscovered, when God's word is remembered, when God's word is then followed, it's contagious. And a Holy Spirit fire spreads. It spreads and it brings people to belief in Jesus' name evidenced in the revivals that we've had throughout this country and throughout the world. This is the street revival uh, here regionally. Charles Finney and the Great Awakening and then John Wesley over in Europe. So this happens generation after generation after generation. It's initiated through prayer and by people remembering what they once knew and rekindling that passion that they have for God. So the inspiration for this whole series scripturally has been 2 Timothy 3.16. I'm going to share this verse with you one last time. 3, 6, 2 Timothy 3.16, the message verse, it says, Every part of scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, and training us to live God's way. Training us to live God's Way. That's why today we are going to look at it because it says all scripture is God breathed. And we've been through the Old Testament. We've been through some of the New Testament. We're going to be in the New Testament today. But we're going to look at a passage all the way at the end of the book. All the way at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation. Now, there are different church groups that have different views on how often you should spend time in the book of Revelation. There are some churches that don't spend any time there, which I think is a mistake, and I'll tell you why in a minute. There are some churches that spend way too much time there, and I think that also is a mistake, and I'll tell you why that is in a minute. The essence of it is this. 
And it's not that anybody's right or wrong or we're perfect because this is actually the first time we've been in the book of Revelation here in, you know, our particular church. But, but the Bible is plenary in nature, right? In fact, the plenary inspiration, inspiration of Scripture means, it means that it's divinely inspired and it's complete from Genesis all the way to Revelation. It's complete and it is, it, it shows us the truth and it shows us everything. It covers all topics. All topics of faith, all topics of life, and all topics of death. Amen? It covers everything. Everything from beginning to the end. Genesis to Revelation. It, here's the thing about uh, inspiration. Now let me personalize this for you. Personal inspiration. Because we know that God's word is the inspired word of God. God inspired the people that wrote this book to write it by the power of the Holy Spirit. How does inspiration work? In us. Here's the thing about personal inspiration. It often comes in two different ways. It is born in two different ways. Sometimes it is born out of great success, right? I mean, it's when you win like the championship, right? You see this, wow, yeah, this is, that's an inspirational moment, right? Like you can just, you can imagine it, right? It's the thrill of victory, I think I've said this before, and the agony of defeat, if you remember this from the, the old, uh, um, you know, uh, sports shows. Wide world of sports. Thank you. Somebody is from my generation. So, uh, little brother. Um, so we've got you know the the uh, the success, and then the other side of that is the crisis, it's the agony of defeat. Right? Inspiration can come out of both of those. Today, today I want to talk about the crisis side of things. Right? The crisis, because I think I think, and I would find it hard really to find. I think somebody that would disagree. God often does His best work in the crisis. In fact, I think crises are essential for spiritual growth because it gives birth to something. You know what it gives birth to? It's this little thing we like to throw, this word we like to throw around at church, and it's called, it's called the testimony. The testimony. The title of today's message is Witness Protection. And this week, I had an opportunity to facilitate uh, and crisis management teams for uh, organizations, in this case, religious organizations. But it could be for any, you know, any organization. So this was the, the topic that was given to me that, that I was tasked to facilitate. And I want to share some of what I shared with them, but I want to personalize it for you as an individual. So a personal crisis can be brought on in, in two ways, right? It can occur externally. It can be something in your environment. So if you're in a situation where there's a natural disaster, that's something that's external, that's affecting you, you're not controlling this, but it creates a crisis in your life. So it could be, it could be an external, uh, external problem. The other way is internally. It's something that can happen internally. So uh, an illness, some sort of health problem, a uh, mental health crisis, right? This is a huge one in our society today. And we see this often, and it manifests in different, different ways. And then we see this, listen, don't, don't underestimate this one, a spiritual crisis. A spiritual crisis. I'm going to give you three definitions here as we go forward. Three definitions. The first one is this. It's the word for crisis. Uh, the word crisis. So crisis, Webster's definition, an unstable or crucial, crucial time or state of affairs in which a decisive change is impending. The next word is challenge. In the, in the sense of a noun, it says a stimulating task or problem. And the last one is change. To undergo transformation, transition, or substitution. I'm going to just speak from my experience here. That change, change is inevitable. Sorry to let you know that if you're not a big fan of change. It is inevitable, right? Life moves forward. So remember backward and just live forward, trick your God. So it, it's... It's something that is going to have, I've experienced this. Sometimes I've fought it, and it just doesn't matter. Change is inevitable. Change does happen. Change comes with certain challenges. It always does. It always comes with some sort of challenges, and sometimes, sometimes change and challenges follow a crisis, right? Many of you are thinking about maybe moments in your life where this very thing, this very thing has happened. Let me give you some examples. Maybe you have a situation where you uh, there's a house fire, and your house catches on fire, and your house burns down, right? This is not an inspirational story, by the way. But this is, you know, that's what happens. It's not your fault, right? There was faulty wiring, something happened, I'm not sure the wires, and, you know, the house caught on fire, and your house burned down, right? So it's not your fault, but it's a crisis, right? 
I mean, nobody would argue that that's not a pretty serious crisis in our life because you instantly become instantly become homeless. It results in, it results in some pretty significant changes in your life. It also it also doesn't instantly resolve itself because you have to get insurance money and you've got to rebuild the house or find enough. something's got to happen. It results in a challenging challenging time in your life. Born out born out of that crisis. Let me give you a spiritual example. Um, the atheist. The atheist, which I've known many in my life, uh, doesn't believe in God, which that's kind of how they, but they actually do believe. You have to believe in something to not believe in it, right? I need to think about this. So, so a nihilist actually doesn't believe in anything. That's the person that really is difficult to minister to. But I don't really shy away from ministering to people that are atheists because I think they believe, if you don't believe in it, you must at some point had to examine whether or not you believed in it. So I think technically you do believe it. Okay, I'm going to move on from that one. So listen, a loved one gets sick. Let's say that you're in this category of person. A loved one gets sick and passes away. And listen, their, their concern for that loved one, their love for that person, it doesn't leave when they pass away. It doesn't stop at death, does it? Right? So a crisis occurs. They immediately have to reconcile this. If they've never experienced it before, what happened to the person that I loved, where did they go? When they die. You have to reconcile that. And it is a difficult thing for somebody that is not a believer, not a believer, to reconcile that they will one never see their loved one again, and that they may not be spending eternity anywhere. Right? It's an internal challenge that immediately is posed to them. And I will tell you that this often is not an accident. And it follows something. Something follows this crisis. It becomes a challenge to the it becomes a challenge to your heart, to your mind, and sometimes, some oftentimes, and I can tell you this with some authority because I've seen it happen, it will the result will change that person and they will become a believer in Jesus, right? It changes their life. God has helped them to overcome their disbelief. That change becomes part of your life, and it often comes from some sort of a crisis. What happens is is it paints this vivid picture of your life's journey and how you got to where you are right now. You know what else it, it does? It makes for an incredible story. It often makes for a really good story that you can share with others. Around here we call that a testimony. That's it. It's a testimony to what, in this case, God has done in your life. So from a spiritual perspective, you had a crisis. It challenged you. Uh, to change, and by the grace of God, in this case, the grace of God and the blood of Jesus, you overcame. The story is a testimony to victory, right? An overcome, an overcoming story, and it's important. It's not only important to you in your life, but it's extremely important to God. I said we're going to be in the book of Revelation, so if you have your Bibles with you, or if you're scrolling along at home, you can go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to give you a little context um, because we have not been in the book of Revelation. I'll give you a little context for this without translating the entire book of Revelation because we just simply don't have time. And there are different schools of thought uh, because it is not clear as crystal. I mean, it takes some interpretation uh, when you read through this book. But really what Revelation is, if you've never been there before, is a timeline of events. Uh, towards the um, the millennial kingdom, uh, Jesus' return, all these things that happen um, as our world kind of kind of progresses. It's basically a timeline, and the passage that we're going to look at falls in the middle of a time called the tribulation period. Now I'm not going to I'm going to try not to convolute this for you very much. Some of you will be familiar, some of you some of you maybe not as much. But there is a seven year period of time called the tribulation, which follows the church age, which is what we're in right now. The church age. This is the, the time that's set apart for God to, to, to uh, for the Holy Spirit to lead people to a belief and understanding in Jesus, right? The bride of Christ. We are being built, the church, in this, in this church age. Uh, there are different views on what happens next. Uh, this is often called the rapture or being uh, being caught up, rapture, the word is not actually in scripture, but, but the idea of us being caught up into the air in, with Jesus. You can read in Thessalonians about this, and you can see how uh, in Thessalonians is that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we will be caught up with Jesus into the clouds. Again, a lot that 
really, I don't have time to unpack, but very interesting study. So whether you believe that happens prior to this seven year period, which is where I tend to fall, or whether you believe it happens somewhere during, or you believe it happens somewhere during the end, regardless, here is where this falls, this story, this passage in Revelation 12, which is where we're gonna be. Three and a half years into that. Three and a half years, actually 1,260 days. I didn't make it up, it's actually written in here, and we'll read it here in a second. There's a verse at the end of the first 11, it's, it's verse 11 of chapter 12, and it's this verse where I read it this week and I thought, this is the thing we used to say, man, that was a good word, you know, we preached somebody had a good sermon, and man, that's a good word, and of course people that didn't, you know, go to church or have any, they know anything, they're like, that's weird. You know, we're, we're Christians are weird, you know that? You ever think about that? You go out into the, the world and, and you, you, you've been part of church for a while, and we develop, develop our own like language, this Christianese language, and we forget when we go out, and we start talking our Christianese language, and people go, what are you saying? What is that? I don't know what, good word? That's weird. So that's what we used to do, and so that was my response to this, this verse when I heard it today, or when I read it this past week, and then I was listening to a podcast as I was driving on the freeway, which I spent a lot of time on, and this verse was mentioned again in this podcast. And I thought, whoa, I, when God does that, I'm like, whoa, because I don't believe in accidents. I mean, my, car, my car is a very spiritual spiritual place. I got a little Mini Cooper, and, and it is a place where God often chooses to put things on my heart and stir in me spirit-filled, uh, spirit-filled emotions. Sometimes it's embarrassing. I just have a quick story about me driving down the freeway and God putting something on my heart. It wasn't this instance, but it was something that, that literally brought me me to tears. I mean, you can t- I can tell you that I've been driving down the freeway, and, and don't tell me this hasn't happened to you in one way, shape, or maybe it was spiritual, maybe it was not. There's a song comes on, and you're starting to sing that song, right? This is my jam, and you're singing that song, I mean, you're going, and then you're like, oh, I hope they saw me singing that song, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the way, I used to care, now I don't, I just sing, I wish you music, whatever I want, you know? I just worship, speak in tongues, whatever I gotta do, right? In my car, whatever God's putting on my heart is what I'm doing. And so sometimes, sometimes God just breaks my mind. Man, this is a poignant story. Man, that was an incredible verse. And I hear something, and I just remember, and I just kind of start to cry. I'm like, oh man, I thank you, God. I look around and I see God's creation, and thank you, God. You know. But I always think there's these truckers right that are coming by me, and they can look right down at my tiny Cooper, right, and they see what's going on. And so this one time, I got off on the rest stop, and I went in to go to the you know the restroom there, and this trucker that had driven by me, I noticed he kind of looked over, and I was like, man, I hope I run into that guy again. Wouldn't you know it, I get off on the, on the rest stop, and I go to the bathroom, and there's a guy coming this way. You know what it was? It was that guy. It was that guy. And he looks at me like, like a look of genuine concern. Like, dude, are you okay? And he didn't say anything to me, but I could tell he was, he was concerned about this. But, but listen, that's the way Scripture, that's the way Scripture is, is in, in this season in my life. At my present level of understanding, this is what Scripture does to me. Sometimes it wrecks me. And it's amazing, and it's awesome, and it's great, because I know God is working, and God is moving. So I want to share the verse, but, you know, I want to, let's just read a little bit of it. Let's read a little bit of Revelation 12 first. This is going to be a little while for some of you, okay? But it's going to bring us to a place. So I'm going to read this, and then I'll explain a little bit as we go along. So Revelation, Revelation 12, starting in verse 1. It says, a great wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. See, you have no idea why that makes me emotional. You have no idea because it's personal, right? This is something God does inside of me. God does the same thing inside of many, many people. And I pray that someday, if it hasn't happened, that he will do the same for you. Here we're talking about a woman, right? A woman clothed with the sun, right? Twelve stars on her head. And here's how most people interpret this. This woman is actually, not Mary, as you'll read through, you'll think that, but this is actually Israel. Israel. And the and this is the twelve stars represent the twelve tribes, the twelve tribes of Israel. Now verse 3. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. I don't think I need to go too much into that. I think you can probably figure out who that is. And seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. 
the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth. So can you guess where this is going? So that he, so that he might devour, this is the red dragon, the devil, Satan, might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a, ma a male child, we know him as Jesus, who will rule all of the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God, to his throne. So Jesus died a physical death, right, on Calvary's cross. And then he, he, we celebrate on Easter, what? His ascension to heaven. The woman fled in the desert place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. There is a period of time during the tribulation, during the tribulation where the Antichrist will reveal himself, and this will send the people of Israel, right, the running into the wilderness. Many people will go to a place, believe they'll go to a place called, called Petra. This is 1,260 days that they will be waiting then for the end of the tribulation period. And verse 7 says, There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was, str but he was not strong enough, and lost and they lost their place in heaven. This could be a reference to something that actually already happened, right? When Satan rebelled against God, he was defeated, and then he was cast out of heaven. And if you read earlier, if you saw, he took, how many? He took a third of the angels, the stars, right? The angels with him. So, the great dragon was hurled down, verse 9, the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now have, now have come the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. Hurled down. Here's the verse. Here's the one that got me. Here's the one that gets me. Here's the one I want to spend some time on. Verse 11. He overcame him. How? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Can you believe it? The blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The, these people that he's talking about here, this is Jesus giving this revelation. And what he's talking about is he's talking about the tribulation saints. So these are going to be people, people that are not believers, but they're going through this tribulation and they become believers in Jesus. They're a remnant that will be there and they will be, they will be believers. They will have the knowledge of the sacrifice of Jesus and they will have a testimony and they play an instrumental part in this particular story and the story of of the future of the church. And so this is where, where we're at. Here's the takeaway. Here's the takeaway. Everything in that is good in this world, not a hard argument to make, is from God. Everything that's good in this world is from God. It's not a hard argument to make that Satan hates pretty much all of it. He doesn't like it, right? If God made it, he don't like it. He would love to much, much, just much rather than get rid of it, do away with it. So much so does he hate this and so bitter is he from being losing and being tossed from heaven that he seeks to create chaos. He seeks to create fusion, confusion for you and me. And how does he do this? Crisis after crisis after crisis. Sometimes from the outside. Sometimes he will use other people, right, to get to us, to, to create crises in our life, to create problems in our life. Sometimes this happens. Oftentimes this happens from the inside, right? You ever heard you're your own worst enemy? Well, sometimes you are, but oftentimes there's somebody pulling the string. And I believe that in this spiritual realm that is also all around us, that there is an enemy that instills worry and fear and rejection and shame and all of these different emotions that are not from God. And it takes us away. It separates us from God because that is not God's best for us. It is not God's best for you. He doesn't want you to live in shame. That's why Jesus died. So you don't have to be ashamed of anything, right? So you feel no shame no more. That's why people don't come to church, because I'm not going to go to church. If I go through the, the if I come to the doors of the church, they're going to catch on fire. Really? No, that's not what the Bible says. The doors of the church, it's, it's the case that you're in the wrong church. 
The doors of the church are open, right? For anyone to come in, regardless of where they're at. Regardless of that. Because that's what God, that's what God, God wants. So just like the future believers, right? The future believers that are in this story, God wants us to know that we are more than overcomers. We're more than overcomers. And this verse tells us why. This verse tells us how. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. John 16, says this. These things, this is Jesus speaking, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. Amen. In the world you will have tribulation. There's that word. In this world you will have tribulation. Here's the promise. But take courage. I have overcome the world, right? This is Christ himself, God himself, proclaiming victory, overcoming every single challenge, every single crisis, every single institute of crisis in your life, every, is, every instance of tribulation, if you want to call it that, has brought about some sort of challenge, which has challenged you to be courageous in the face of some sort of adversity. And if you stand courageous with God in that challenge, then you can, based on this verse, you can institute change in your life. You can be an overcomer by the power and the presence of God and the Holy Spirit in your life because of your belief in the blood of the Lamb and the word of what comes out of it is your testimony. Amen? It's important. It's important for your own spiritual growth and journey. It's important as a witness to others and is extremely important to God. Here's three practical reasons. Three practical reasons why you should share your testimony. The first one is this. Your story is specific to you. Your story is yours and yours alone. You know, the Bible says that every time someone becomes a believer in Jesus, that the angels rejoice. I always love this vivid picture, right? The angels rejoice. That means that there's a moment in time, every time somebody professes their faith in Jesus, that God throws some sort of party. Now, you can use your imagination to... Some people will look at this and maybe this is some very liturgical thing and there's like trumpets and horns and I'm pretty sure it's electric guitars and drums and I don't know, that's just me, right? I think God throws a party. I mean, I think he's probably singing like, we, we are family. Do we, do these guys do that. We are, we are family. I can't, I can't even start. So at any rate, I mean, that's just party. That's how excited God is when people come back to him, right? Separated, separated birth, reunited, when you're born again as a believer in Jesus Christ. I want to share with you my testimony of faith, the moment I became a believer. And just in case you're thinking this is going to be a really poignant, deep story, it's not. It's not, but it is my story. So I was 13, 13 years old, and I was uh, going to church. Uh, we went on occasion. And I was going to a church in Seattle where I grew up. Pacific Northwest. And uh, church, I'm pretty sure it was Overlake Christian Church. It was a huge church up there now. Shout out to Overlake people. If you've watched, they're not. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, it was Overlake Christian. It was a church camp. It was a summer camp. Uh, it was summertime. It was a rare sunny day in Seattle because the sun never shines there. And it was, we, there was a, um, there was a river. I remember, I don't remember the exact place. Um, there was a guy that had this super fast boat. At least at 13, I thought, wow, this is crazy. And so I remember that day we were out on this boat, and you know, it was it was cool. We did a lot of cool activities, and it was this church camp kind of things. At night, they had a service, like you know, like a worship service, and somebody would speak. And I vaguely remember going into this this old wooden chapel, and um, it's maybe about the size of this room. And uh, I remember on the screen, I'm taking you back here. This is you know, 80s, late 80s, and this band was playing. They were playing this video from this band called Striper. You ever heard of these guys? Well, this is like a heavy metal Christian rock band. Now, if, you're in, if you don't like that kind of stuff, I'm sorry. You know. But I was 13, and I thought it was cool, right? This is when every, all the big hair bands were out. And this is what all my friends were listening to. I was like, yeah, you know, rock and roll. And then this band came out. I was like, wow. And they're singing Christian music. I'm like, that's kind of different. I'm not saying Striker brought me to the Lord, but it was definitely something that perked my ears up. And so through the course of the night, uh, there were conversations that we had. Uh, there was a sermon that was preached. Uh, somebody preached God's word. And at the end of that time, there was an invitation. And it was at that time, at 13 years old, at that camp, Oakland Christian camp, 
in Seattle that I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. I became a believer in Jesus Christ. Right? That's it. That's my testimony, right? It's not spectacular. <laughs> it's not. I'm not going to write a book about that. You know, it's like it's not even a pamphlet, really. It's, it's my story. It's the one that I have to tell. It's not the most captivating thing that's ever happened to me. In fact, I have a lot, a lot of very captivating stories about the goodness of God in my life. Many other testimonies, right, that brought me out of serious crises, personal crises, financial crises, health crises, all sorts of things. That would, some of them would blow your mind. And I'm sure you have some of them, too. But that's not the one God wants me to continue to share. Oh, that's, those are good. He says you can tell those when you get a chance, when you get an opportunity, because he'll use those too. But the one thing that he wants me to share is this simple story about me coming to the knowledge of Christ, me becoming a believer in Jesus. Why does he want me to share that? Because here's my argument for you. The biggest crisis that any of us will ever face is our separation from God. Am I wrong? It is bigger than any financial crisis. It is better, bigger than any illness you will face. It is bigger than anything you will face on this earth. Because if you are separated from God, that means when you leave here, you are not spending eternity in heaven with him. That is a crisis of huge magnitude. A huge, huge crisis. And that's why that story is so important. Because it is the moment that God decided he was going to end that crisis in my life. And he gave me an opportunity to do it. And based on my decision to accept him, he says, you know what? Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. I'll prepare a place for you. And that's exactly what Jesus said. I go to prepare. In my house, there are many mansions. I go there to prepare a place for you. Amen? God's getting your mansion ready. Getting your mansion ready. That comes from Jewish culture. You know that? It comes from Jewish culture because in Jewish culture, there would be a betrothal. And they would have the, the man, and he would he would ask, you know, be a dowry. He would ask for the, 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 uh, the, the woman's hand in marriage. And then he would spend the next year building an addition onto his father's house. Oh. Does it make you look at that passage a little different? In my house there are many mansions. I go there to prepare a place for you, bride of Christ. For you, child of God. The biggest crisis you'll ever face is separation from God. The most important story that you will ever tell is your own story about the day that God gave you the knowledge of his incredible love through the sacrifice of his son Jesus. Amen? Amen. Here's your second, second point. Second reason that sharing your testimony is important. It's a reminder of what Jesus did for you. It's a reminder of the moments that surrounded you and, and, and put something inside of you that that the Spirit got a hold of you and you took a leap of faith. And you took a leap of faith towards God. Away from whatever was happening in your life at the time. Now, I didn't have anything in particular. I can't tell you that there was a crisis, like, you know, physical crisis. There was nothing going on at 13. But something told me I needed to step forward. Something told me I needed to move forward and I needed to become a believer in Jesus. Every time you share your testimony, listen, because it's scary, it's hard to do, I know it, and even if it's a simple one, because sharing your testimony is, is, is it, and you're opening yourself up, and when you're sharing your testimony, oftentimes, you should be sharing it with people that aren't believers in Jesus, but when you do it, more and more, the stronger you get, and the more confident you get, right? Practice makes perfect. This is the textbook example. The more that you share it, the more you share it, the better, the better you will get at it, and the more confident, the more confident you will be. It gives you the courage to fight all those things we talked about earlier, right? Because that's what Satan is trying to do, is keep your mouth shut. But we have to fight that. The final reason to share your testimony is this. Number three, people like to hear stories. I mean, people like to hear stories. If you know anything about me, you know that I like stories, and I like to tell stories. And sometimes my stories are meandering. But, but I love them. I love hearing them. I think they're poignant. I think that they can take you to a place visually that you might not otherwise be able to be brought. I mean, I've been you know, through academia, uh, but I've never learned as much as I have when I've heard somebody speak or teach using stories. Why do you think Jesus taught that way? <laughs> I mean, Jesus taught that way. God wired us to respond to him and interact 
through our own life experiences. You meet somebody for the first time, what do you do? You start telling them about your life, right? <laughs> I had a friend that would, he would tell everybody about his life. But I mean, some people are open books, right? Some people are a little more reserved, but, but we get to know each other in relationship by talking about our life experiences. And then we can sharpen each other because maybe I've had an experience that you had. And so you share your you know, testimony with me, right? It doesn't have to be a come to Jesus testimony. It could be any way that God maybe worked in your life. And then I share mine and we come together and we collaborate with God and we say, oh, we're together now and we can probably, we have something in common. That's how you develop friendships. That's how it works. By the sharing, by the sharing of experiences through our life. The testimony is very important. Very important for evangelism, for preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus, for making disciples, right? It's very, very important. Evangelism is not a 12-step process. It's not some checklist. Although there are some religions and there are some denominations that will everybody tries to make it a process. Here's the come to Jesus checklist. It's not like that, right? That's not what we find. That's not what we read about in Scripture. You know, we're going to have a talk. We're going to, um, it's gonna, we're going to go to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And then, you know, we're going to say a prayer. Then you got to get baptized. Then you got to go to your communion. Then, you know, you got to get a Bible study. If you don't do all of those things, well, I don't know. If you don't check all the boxes, I don't know. You might not make it. You might not make it to everlasting life in heaven. No, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If I confess with my, mouth, with my heart and believe with my mouth that he is Lord, then he is Lord of my life, right? That is the essential. It is the essential belief in Jesus Christ. I mean, we have in the essentials, what, unity, right? Non-essentials, liberty. In all things, love. It's not mine. It's Aquinas. I think Thomas Aquinas said that. The fact of the matter is, we don't have to agree with everything all the time. But the single thing that we should agree on is that belief in Jesus Christ connects us with God. It connects us with God, amen? And there is no other requirement. No other requirement other than us putting our faith in what Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary's cross. All of these are elements of salvation. Some of them are a response to salvation. But the terms... Frankly, and the words that are in our Bible, if we're talking about an evangelistic movement, right? If we're talking to people that don't know anything about God, uh, they don't know it. They don't understand it, right? Good word. You know, what's that? Good word. Why don't you talk English? They don't know what we're saying. They don't understand what's in the Bible. And we're, it burns inside of us. And we're trying to explain it to them, but we can't because we're, kind of, we're trying to do it with some sort of academia, and it just doesn't work like that. It doesn't, does it work like that in the other relationships in your life? It doesn't work like that with God either. There are elements of salvation. But to the unbeliever, they cannot see it. They cannot see it unless the Spirit of God opens the heart and the eyes of the man alone. They cannot, cannot see it. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Your story is more important than you think. An unbeliever will be captivated by your story. In a sense, God and the Holy Spirit will use your story to speak to them, to prepare their heart for what he has for them in his word, right? This is how God desires for us to use it. So if you're not telling your story, if you've never told your story, I would encourage you to take a step of faith and do that. Because it'll strengthen you, it'll help others, and it will help us all to move forward to glory. You know? By the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of your testimony. Will you pray with me? God, we come to you today. God, we come to you today and we thank you for the plenary nature of your word. We thank you that your word is complete from beginning to end. We thank you from the we thank you from Genesis, the genealogy. We thank you all the way through the, the story of salvation that you began actually back in Genesis, God. That we see Jesus all through the prophetic nature of, of your word. That we see the, the incarnate Jesus all throughout the Old Testament, and then come to realize him in the birth of the child 
that we'll come and celebrate here next month. God, we just thank you so much for everything that you do. We thank you for the, the knowledge of the future, God, that we know that we might not dwell on those things that are about to happen that we may or may not be able to control. But we know, God, that our belief in you means that we have secured a place. Because we know, we know, we know that there's a place for us based on our belief in you. God, we thank you for being there for us in the crises that we face here on earth. Pray for anybody that is here or anybody that is watching that may be going through a crisis right now. Because crisis will bring about some sort of a challenge. And if it's a spiritual crisis, God is going to challenge your heart. And God is going to challenge your heart by the Holy Spirit. Opening the eyes of your heart and your mind to see some things that you need to change. And guess what? He doesn't want you to do it alone. That's why he gives you the opportunity to become a believer in Jesus Christ. We're going to a time of communion. I want to give you that chance. If you have not ever put your faith in Jesus Christ. If you don't have that testimony yet, let me give you a chance to do that today. And like I said, it's as easy as it could possibly be. You know more than most people based on what we've read today. But the gospel is simple. I mean, the gospel is simple. It is about a God who gave his son Jesus. We were separated from God at birth and we are reunited with God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, which we'll remember here in a moment. And if you believe that in your heart today and just cry out, Jesus, Jesus, come into my life. Jesus, come into my crisis. Holy Spirit, challenge me. Holy Spirit, change me. Jesus, Jesus. God, we love you. God, we praise you. God, we honor you. In Jesus' name.